All right, here we are. Another Friday Facebook Live. It, today is August 18th, 2023. Please, in the chats, uh, or shall, I should say the comment section, let us know where you're, uh, where you're listening from today and what's the temperature where you are. Today we have a very, very special guest. We have Dr. Doug Lyle joining us from Doug. Where are you? Where are you uh, live from today? Sacramento. Sacramento. What's the heat there today? It's getting up there. I think we'll be a hundred today. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, we got you by about seven degrees here in Austin. Oh yeah. There you go. All good. It's one hundred and seven. You're a swimmer. You've got to get a, get a pool sometime today. I'm sure. Oh, I've already been in the pool twice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What about yourself? Have you been on the basketball court anytime soon or recently? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been on the basketball court. And uh, so so when I see you in October, I'll, I'll be showing you I'll be showing you the upgrade of the shot. Oh, no. I love it. I love it. For people that don't know what uh, Doug and I are talking about, Doug is quite the basketball player, and on many occasions he has schooled me either in one-on-one -on -one or horse uh, or 33, whatever it is. And Doug is, you're probably five years my senior. Yeah. <laughs> A couple yeah. of years my senior. I just, sure. I just turned 60 recently. Um, and I consider myself, you know, a pretty good athlete. And Doug, you just, you got my number. <laughs> and well, it's kind of infuriating. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're the, you, you do it all, but when you do it all, you can only be so good, right? <laughs> I only do one thing. That's it. Speaking that's of it. which. Yeah. So, um, well, first let me, let me make a proper introduction. So for those of you that don't know who, who Doug is, Doug is an evolutionary psychologist. Doug is the author of the pleasure trap. That is really an iconic, uh, part of anyone that wants to succeed eating whole food plant-based. You really want to understand the principles of the pleasure trap. Doug has, has taught at Stanford University. You've taught everything from statistics uh, to psychology. You're one of the lead researchers at uh, the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California with your lifelong buddy, Alan Goldhammer. Um, and then you also we're very fortunate. You've been part of the Plan Strong <clears throat> retreat team for nine years, where you give really typically three or four of your iconic lectures. And this October in Sedona, October 9th to the 15th, you're going to be joining us. You'll be doing the pleasure trap, of course. You'll be doing how to get along without going along. And then the last lecture that you give that's absolutely brilliant is how to weigh less or how to lose weight without losing your mind. That's it. And uh, that actually is a topic that I want to dive into today in light of the fact that yesterday, one of the lead articles in the New York Times, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's called, We Know Where, where a New Late we know where new weight loss drugs came from, but not why they work. And the article is by a woman that does a lot of writing on health. Her name is Gina Colada, and she's been writing on weight loss and drugs and diet and exercise for 25 years. And she says that, in her opinion, none of these things have any kind of lasting effect, but she is kind of convinced that these new drugs may potentially be a, a game changer that can change the world and weight loss. So Doug, given, you know, your, your background um, and your vast knowledge in this subject, I want to start by diving into this and we may spend the whole 45 minutes on this subject, uh, but people feel free to throw a question in for Doug of, about this or anything that you want, because uh, this to me is Super, super important. So for starters, Doug, let me, are you aware of these weight loss drugs like uh, Ozempic and uh, Wagonia, Wagonia, I think it's pronounced? Yes, uh, I am. And I, my, my reaction to these, uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure your dad uh, could, could sit down and, and tell you stories about, about um, 
how whenever there's some new drug that's supposed to be be the big the big fancy cure to whatever the problem is the you can expect it to be ushered in with a lot of excitement and a lot of press uh, these are you know, these are un unbelievably lucrative and important you know business opportunities for the pharmaceutical industry and for medicine and so there's a bunch of excitement a lot, bunch of confidence um, and you know Ralph Nader has a rule don't take any drug that hasn't been out there for seven years <laughs> like, and in this case, these drugs have been around for use for other things, but still, they haven't been used like this uh, for for this problem, these dosages. Uh, and so it, pe people charging into this thing, uh, I think, are are making a, a, a classic mistake, uh, which is that you don't actually know what the long term cost benefit is. And so we're, we're not going to know for a while. And but people are, I understand people are desperate and they, they feel like they cannot manage this problem and they don't understand actually how to manage it intelligently. And so, mm -hmm. and uh, the energy conservation strategy inside of humans, they just want it fixed. And uh, the, these particular drugs, um, I know I'm kind of running all over the place with this, but these particular drugs uh, I'm hearing and I, I, I can't verify this, but I'm going to tell you what I think is true. Yeah. Uh, I'm hearing uh, from multiple clients over the last six months that are frustrated with their weight and want to do weight loss that they go to their doctors and their doctors say, look, you know that your ob obesity, that this is a, this is a big risk. For, you know, this is a big problem with your health. And so therefore we have to do something Yes, there's side effects, but, you know, it's this trade-off. Um, this comes from the physician. Uh, the physicians actually don't really understand, quite frankly, they don't understand the nature of the etiology of health and disease. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they're, they're, they're not trained particularly in this. And so as a result of that, they have a misunderstanding of what it means to... Um, to see a correlation coefficient between obesity and disease. So when, when, when the studies that show the correlation between obesity and disease would make the average physician very susceptible to believing that obesity is causing disease processes. Mm -hmm. Obesity is not causing disease processes. It's the food that you eat to make you obese that is causing the disease processes. That is a very, very different thing, okay? Can you can can you repeat that one more time? Because I think that's very important to have that sink in. Right. So, the the the, the physicians, I believe, this is what I can't verify. Uh, I know that many physicians believe that obesity is a cause of health problems. That is, for all intents and purposes, or most intents and purposes, this is not true. Okay. The, it is the diet that causes the obesity that is the cause of the, of the health problems. So the obesity is a side effect of multidimensional system-wide problems that are caused by the foods that, that are overly rich for people. And obesity is just a marker of the fact that that's the foods that they're eating. So to blame obesity for the health problems that are correlated with obesity is absurd. Mm. Okay, so mm. this is this is very much like uh, you see exactly the same lack of understanding in medical doctors around high blood pressure medication. So uh, doctors say, "Well, you, we've got to get that blood pressure down. It's a risk. It's like a risk of what? Well, you know, cardiovascular disease. It's like no, it's not. High blood pressure doesn't cause cardiovascular disease." The same thing that causes the high blood pressure causes the cardiovascular disease. So if you take a person that has, you know, blood pressure of 170 over 110 and you medicate them down with high blood pressure medication, you haven't reduced their risk of heart attack at all. Mm -hmm. Not by 1%. Okay. You just made them look like a person who has a lower risk factor. You made them look like a healthier person, but you didn't make them into a healthier person because the blood pressure itself isn't the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, the blood pressure is, in fact, uh, there, there would be three sort of problems 
that would come out of high blood pressure or are associated with it that terrify people and medical doctors, i.e. heart attacks and strokes. And strokes come in two types. They come in embolisms and they come in hemorrhages. And so an embolism is a clot. That's the same thing that causes a heart attack. And a, a hemorrhage is a, is a vessel breaking and bleeding into the brain. Now, it's going to turn out that heart attacks and embolisms, uh, those are not influenced by blood pressure. They're associated with blood pressure because the same diet that clogs up your arteries and causes havoc in the cardiovascular system that results in you throwing clots, that diet will also cause you to have high blood pressure. But the mm. high blood pressure isn't causing those events. It's just a correlate. Okay. Now, it turns out that 90% of all strokes are embolisms. 10% of them are hemorrhages, where a blood, mm. blood vessel breaks. Mm. So those are influenced by blood pressure. So the higher the blood pressure is, it's putting more pressure on those veins. And as a result, it's more likely that we're going to get one to burst. So if your blood pressure is extremely high, then you are increasing your likelihood of a hemorrhagic stroke. But remember, hemorrhagic strokes are only 10% of all strokes. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to medicating people with high blood pressure medication to get their numbers lower, to make them look like they're healthier people, the only influence that it's having that's positive is a reduction in the likelihood of a hemorrhagic stroke. Now, almost all hemorrhagic strokes are taking place in people with very high blood pressure. So they're taking place in people with 170, 180, 190. They're not taking place down to people with 140. But notice where modern medicine puts the, the place where we start medicating people. You start medicating them down at 140, even quote, pre-high blood pressure, borderline, we're gonna take it down to 130, 135, because that's mm -hmm. everybody. So now, now you massively increase the market. You're medicating people like crazy with this medication that has almost no positive effect at all. The only thing it does is modest reductions in the likelihood of hemorrhagic strokes, which are rare. But the average medical doctor has no idea that this is true. They think that it's making you look like a person who has a better cardiovascular profile. It thinks that it's taking you, if you're a 160 over 100, it's taking you down to 135 over 85. And it's like, well, you've got a 50% less likelihood of having a heart attack. No, you mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. You absolutely do not have a 50% less likelihood of a heart attack. You have exactly the same likelihood of a heart attack because the diet and health of the cardiovascular system hasn't changed at all as a result of taking that medication. You just look like you belong to a category like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I make my middle name, uh, Michael, that doesn't make me part Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's not going to help. If I actually go down to the courthouse and change my name to Michael Jordan Lyle, it is not going to help my basketball game at all. <laughs> it makes me look like it makes my on paper. It makes me look like I'm better, but I'm not any better. And the yeah. same thing is true with using drugs to make numbers look better. So when uh, a Zimpic drives somebody's, you know, takes 18 pounds off of somebody that's 220 pounds, which is typically the result that, that is seen in the studies. So if you're a 225 five pound person and you lose 18 pounds from using this medication as it's prescribed and it was done in the drug trials, then the question is, is your health profile better now? 18, you know, now down at 207 than it was at 225. And the answer is, well, you're not actually any healthier at all. The question is whether or not, a, the, but the doctor says that you statistically look like you're better because it looks like you're in a category of a less obese human. So we've had some gains there. Well, nobody knows if there's any gains. Mm -hmm. So in, in actually studying the long-term cost-benefit analysis with respect to health, that is unknown, and I am always deeply suspicious of any drug that that you know changes a body so significantly that it would cause you to drop ten percent of your body weight. That is no small interfering factor, and right. anything that can do that, I believe, is going to be having rel relatively profound influence on all kinds of bodily systems, and it's likely to have the straining. Uh, systems pretty aggressively in a way that they weren't designed to be strained. So we well, got problems. Yeah. And in the, in the article, they talk about how, what they're doing 
with these drugs is they're exposing the brain to levels of a natural home hormone at, at, at these levels that have never been seen in nature before ever. So you're right. Uh, there's, there's obviously some weird stuff going on there and, you know, kind of in, in doing, reading the article, um, one of the, one of the scientists that's been working on these weight loss drugs for, you know, 20, 30 years, uh, says that, you know, when he was working on, well, do you increase the leptin or do you block the ghrelin, right? Yes. He, he basically came to the realization because he wasn't having any success with humans. Yeah. Yeah. They had fantastic success with mice. Yeah. But with humans, none. And so and he came to the conclusion that the body has so many redundant circuits of interacting nerve impulses and hormones uh, to control weight loss that just tweaking one basically doesn't make a difference. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you this, Doug. Because one of the things this article talks about is, is obesity a moral failing by us or is it a, or is it a chronic disease? I mean, I think you've already answered it, but I mean, how would you answer that question? Okay. It, it's neither. So uh, uh, what, what this is, is a natural consequence of having a diet that has been altered away from human nature. And so the diet is now... Uh, far richer in calorie density than it was designed to be. And so, and it's going to turn out that animal nature is to, to try to conserve energy. In other words, basically life is the process of trying to get your hands on energy and then expend it and the processes needed to keep you surviving and, and reproducing. So that, that is essentially what the life process is, is, uh, the acquisition of resources, primarily energy, but there are other resources too. Uh, but, but primarily, uh, uh, energy is the, uh, like, like a shelter would be another resource that you would, you would seek out and try to get, for example, but, but the, um, but food is unbelievably important. And so it's, it's your, it's the primary energy source. Ambient heat is obviously another one. The, um, but this is a primary uh, resource that you're designed by nature to have exquisitely well engineered preferences to let you know that if you're if you're sitting in, in front of a bunch of lettuce uh, in you know in the middle of a, of a uh, meadow somewhere and you put it put it in your mouth and you can actually chew it and taste the tiniest bit of sugar that's inside some romaine or something so it actually tastes a little bit sweet. And you're like, hey, I can eat this. You know, I can't eat the grass, but I could eat this. And you sit there and start eating it. By the time you eat a pound of it and pretty well fill your stomach up, you shouldn't be designed by nature to be satisfied with this. Mm. Because if you do this and you did this three or four times a day, you'd eat three or 400 calories that day and you would starve to death in pretty short order uh, on such a diet. So the nervous system has to be really good at chemo reception. It has to know the chemical content of what it is that you're eating within pretty close parameters. And it does. So it can tell the difference between a chocolate shake and an apple. And it, it, it knows that the chocolate shake has vastly more calories in it than the apple does. And so it's going to turn out that of course, then what you should see throughout nature is a preference uh, in animals for the richer food. And anybody that's ever fed a dog, a dog treat knows this. I mean, this is really obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, just your kid isn't pulling on your sleeve trying to get another carrot out of you. Your kid's pulling wants another pop tart, obviously. And so, this isn't a moral failing. This is an evolutionary imperative that this is the way that we're designed. So now, now you've got an interesting problem. So for the first time in life on Earth ever, one species actually has the ability to be eating foods that are unnaturally concentrated if they choose to do so? And the answer is, well, every one of them will choose to do so as long as they're designed properly by evolution, which they are. Yeah. <laughs> so as a result, this is what human beings are gonna prefer to eat. And that means that they're gonna be systematically overeating on this food because instead of being six or 700 calories a pound on average for the diet, it's a thousand. And so, 
of course, they're going to be eating a thousand calorie pound food. And as a result of that, they're going to be systematically overeating by 30% a day, whatever it is, four or 500 calories a day. And then their bodies will reach an equilibrium at that higher level of food intake mm -hmm. over a lifetime. And so the average American woman gains two pounds a year uh, starting in, on her 16th birthday to 36 year, uh, by her 36th birthday, she's 40 pounds overweight. So what this is, is that this is the natural biological equilibrium that takes place when you enrich the diet. This is precisely what happens when they're fatting, fattening up hogs for slaughter. They add molasses to the feed. The molasses is high calorie density. It's basically pure sugar. So as a result of that, the, the hogs don't, don't stop eating until they've now eaten more calories than they would have normally eaten. And that's how they get big. That is precisely how it is that you put weight on an animal. And that's how we put weight on the entire United States population. <laughs> it's not a moral failing and it's not a disease. It's a, it's a, it's a behavioral regulation nightmare mm. because you, you are mm. simply doing what you're designed to do. And if you do doing what you're designed to do in an environment that's unnatural, we wind up with problems. Right. So, I mean, I think the latest figures from the <clears throat> CDC show that what 42% of American adults are <clears throat> obese, like 75% of us are considered overweight or obese. Um, and yeah. the, the, the environment has become so uh, polluted with these hyper concentrated forms of calories. Do you see a way, a way out? Um, you know, in the next five, 10 years with, with the power that the, these big food companies have to push their products, you know, everywhere they want them. No, I, I don't. In other words, I, I think you're looking at situation normal. So in other words, I think that, that what you're actually looking at is that there's going to be a small percentage of people. They're going to be brighter than average and they're going to be more conscientious than average. Uh, and they're going to happen to have a curiosity in this arena. So um, peop, uh, it's going to turn out, interestingly enough, that would surprise us that, that men are interested in sports and women are very interested in food. <laughs> and uh, it's going to turn out that, that sports is how men ultimately got food, i.e. put a spear in your hand and go chase things down. Women were always the nurturing creatures that are going to be doing the cooking and then they're going to, and they're concerned with the food prep, et cetera. So this is, it's going to turn out that in any nutrition program in, in the United States, you're going to find it dominated by women. Women are inherently interested in food. They're also interested in people. Men are interested in things. <laughs> <laughs> Men have a very strong interest in, in machinery. Okay. So this is a, uh, these are differences. And I forget where I'm going with this as I just sort of wandered off topic. But the it's point good. is, is that, that men aren't even interested in their food. They <clears> just <throat> want rich food. They, they're not going to be studying it. They're not going to become knowledgeable about nutrition. They couldn't care less. So you've got half of the population that is basically uneducable. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that we begin there. Well, and right? the question, and the question was, you're like, yeah. So with the number with the food environment we have yes uh are, we're basically doomed and you were like yes except for some people that yes, yes. and you've yeah. got you've got a significant percentage of women that are inherently very interested in nutrition food they're going to feed their children they're concerned about feeding their families they're and there's a certain percentage of people that are health conscious uh, that that are understanding that there's going to be some underlying principles of nature here, that the input and the output and the cost, you know, the cost and benefit, that there's cause and effect relationships between what on earth you put in your body and what happens to it. And mm -hmm. so there's a certain percentage of people that are inherently interested and they will discover what, what it is that we know and they'll just and they'll utilize it and they'll be successful. That will be the minority of humans. So um, hu human nature is not built for this problem. This is an unnatural problem. Mm -hmm. So therefore, only a few percentage of people, I don't know what it is, 10, okay? <clears throat> probably 10% of humanity 
has the necessary prerequisite nature uh, of their psychology that they could actually pull something like this off. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. it, to, to those of us that have that it's, it's frustrating and bizarre that other people can't adopt this. It's like, we can't understand why you wouldn't do this. <laughs> no, it, <laughs> It's kind of like a wall street inside trader. Like, <laughs> Don't you know? You're just supposed to cheat. Like, what are you, a fool? You're just investing in regular stuff? No, don't be an idiot. Get inside information. So in mm -hmm. other words, if, if you look at things a certain way, you can't understand why everybody wouldn't do it this way. And you and I can't understand why wouldn't you be unbelievably interested in treating your body extremely well and ha having a high percentage chance of really good long-term outcomes. And the answer is, gee, yeah, uh, that's because uh, you're an oddball. <laughs> exactly. Well, let me let me ask you this, Doug, because <clears throat> I would imagine that these doctors that specialize in obesity, right? I mean, from in the article, it basically talks about how. Let me just say. So, um, in July. Doctors in the U.S. wrote 94,000 prescriptions a week for Wagovia and then 62,000 for uh, Ozempic or however you pronounce it. Um, there, these, some of these obesity medical specialists are booked a year in advance. We, we know with all the different surgeries that are going on how desperate people are. Yes. Um, and according to the article, some of these newer drugs that are going out, and what's interesting is most of these weight loss drugs, one of the side effects from, they originally were diabetes drugs. Yes. And one of the side effects is weight loss. And I guess it's kind of suppressing their appetite. So they're not always thinking about food, mm -hmm. but is uh, there's this new drug that supposedly is achieving 25% weight loss. Mm -hmm. It's in the very early stages, but like if I'm 200, 200 pounds and mm -hmm. I can get down to 150 by taking this drug and it has the potential to reverse some of my di di diabetes symptoms. Um, and I just feel like I, I am not, I can't be troubled with whole food plant-based. Right. I just, I've, I love my pleasure trap. You know, I love these hyper concentrated foods too much. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it, sometime in the future, even maybe even now, there's, there's a time and a place for these drugs? Um, I would say the, the answer to that question is, is that we don't know because we don't know their long-term effects. Yeah. So the, um, th that is, th the question is, is there a legitimate cost benefit analysis for any drug? And that, that is always an open question. So for example, they spent a lot, awful lot of money working to figure out Viagra. So instead, you know, you, you could, have, could have listened to our friends and they would have said, well, geez, just, you know, eat, eat some freaking decent food and let's make sure you don't have vascular disease. And that problem is a canary in the coal mine. So therefore, you know, you shouldn't be making that mousing your way around it. You should be fixing the underlying problem. And a whole bunch of people are going to say, not interested in fixing the underlying problem. Just give me my, my Viagra. And on, we could sit back and think, is humanity better off for that, for that innovation or isn't it? And there would be, you know, I'm sure you could make a case that people would say, well, I'm <clears> better <throat> off because that Vi Viagra exists. Fair enough. In the same way, we're going to probably find the same things that, that some people's lives will be better off from these drugs. If it turns out that their mm -hmm. risk profile isn't too bad, but you know, a lot of side effects can be really nasty. Oh, and so you're talking about you're paying, playing Russian roulette with the only body you've got. Yeah. And this is well, just not the way I roll. <laughs> well, I, in the article, it mentions how two of the main side effects, one is malnutrition and the other is facial aging. I mean, who wants premature facial aging? But I, I guess maybe, you know, pancreatitis. Uh, Exactly. You got some diarrhea. <laughs> no, you, you're, I mean, this is, uh, I can't, you know, when it comes to anybody's medical decisions, including bariatric surgery, yeah. the, um, I, I can understand the desperation that people have and the, and the, the frustration that they have 
um, and that they that they feel cornered and they will quote do anything. I understand it because I've talked to you know I, I talk to a thousand people a year and probably two hundred of those people are calling me about weight issues. Yeah. So I, I'm talking to three or four people a week in phone consultations about weight issues. And my solution is, of course, never to go to any drugs and or any surgery. It's to to uh, the people that are calling me are smart enough and interested enough because mm-hmm. they found me. They're not calling me randomly that uh, they would like to do, you know, to, to uh, essentially go plant strong and do a good job of this. But they're struggling with the challenges that are associated with this that we know can be can be formidable. And so. That's my job. My job is to troubleshoot those things, to break this thing down, to make it simpler and make it uh, increase your, a person's probability of success. I've had so much success that it, it makes me confident to the level of arrogant. In other words, it's like, listen, just call me and we will find a plan, whatever it is. If we have to throw you in jail at an engine two retreat, that's what we, you know, whatever it is that we need to do. But there is a pathway from where you are now to where it is that you want to go that is sane, reasonable, and achievable. Okay. The uh, but there are you know there are efforts that need to be made to get you there. And if you want the outcome instead of doing the process properly, and you want to cut out a precious organ that you can never recover, or you want to drug a system in a way that has unpredictable results that you have to cross your fingers and hope you're not one of the quote rare side effects whose body is permanently destroyed. That, you know, if you don't want, if you want to do it differently, there is a safe, reasonable, and ultimately lifetime sustainable process that will have comprehensive health benefits that to me, it's, there's no reasonable choice on the chessboard. But if you ask the question population wide among desperate people, you know what I'm saying? That, that feel like they can't do this, won't do this, will never learn about this and just want some results. Will these drugs be a net benefit to, to, to this uh, civilization? Maybe. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. And I, I'm not really that interested in that question. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested in doing this thing right. Um, you know, what's interesting is supposedly in these drugs, and we talked about how there's this excessive amount of a uh, levels of these 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 hormones, but supposedly there's this thing called GLP-1, um, and patients they get five times the amount of this GLP-1 than they would in a Thanksgiving dinner. Just to yes, you know, put it out there how unnatural um, yes. the levels of of certain things in these drugs are. Mm-hmm. And to your point, like you're playing Russian roulette. You are, yeah. you know, I, I just got a e- email from a young man in another country that uh, once talked to me about the fact that he has uh, uh, what appears to be a, between the ages of 15 and 18, he was uh, given uh, antidepressants, completely mm-hmm. reasonable. In other words, that, that is considered completely reasonable medicine. Some depressed young man went into his physician, his physician prescribed him one of these SSRIs, the the most common antidepressants in the world. And he has apparently permanently dysfunctional sexual function Mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. That is a rare but known side effect. Now, you think about that, okay? It's like, wow, if I had known that that was a possibility, Maybe I would have not been, I wouldn't have taken that medication and I would have done other things that might've been reasonable about trying to address my depression. So this is, you know, and and I, as someone who has lived in this space now for 40 years, I've talked to 300 of those people in my life, not that specific side effect, but I took this drug and now I'm permanently maimed. I'm Mm -hmm. taking that drug. I'm permanently maimed. And now we are coming behind there with whole natural foods and water fasting at True North and and functional medicine from the from the best people that we can find to try to Mickey Mouse our way around and hopefully recover some of the function that is caused by the damage of the drugs. So you will never sell me that the new hot item on the drug market that's going to solve some problem uh, 
you'll sell it to me if healthy living, if unhealthy living wasn't the cause and healthy living isn't the cure. Mm -hmm. Then I'm all ears. Okay. You got some bizarre problem that human beings occasionally get that has nothing to do with their diet and lifestyle. And there's no possible reversal of diet and lifestyle. Now you got my attention. But you start talking about obesity, forget yeah. about it. We know the cause and we know the cure. And so therefore, I'm not interested in the new whiz bang. Because well, that new whiz bang is going to have many, many tragedies associated with it. Well, you know, I got this toenail fungus, Doug, and it doesn't matter what I eat. Nothing seems to resolve it. And, you know, you, you I went on some, some medicine that you take and you have to actually have your liver checked every couple months to make sure it's not wreaking havoc on your liver. Yes. But it like resolved it in about two months. Pretty, yes. pretty crazy. There you go. Yeah. But now the thing with cholesterol and uh, you know elevated blood pressure, these meds and these weight loss meds, yeah. I mean, the doc, you know, when we're at our retreats, the doctors say you're going to be on this for the rest of your life. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, no, I don't think anybody wants to be on a drug for the rest of their life. Yeah. That doesn't sound. That doesn't sound like a smart move. Yeah, it's it sounds like an unbelievably lucrative campaign. Right. Okay. Is what this is. And so, and it is lucrative. So I think it was estimated mm -hmm. at one point that if you can get a young kid on, on Ritalin for their quote ADHD, that's a $200,000 patient for the pharmaceutical industry. Oh God. Okay. So don't think they don't have it gamed out. So right. the, the, I'm sure that, you know, if I was really a mercenary rep, when this medication uh, came out, I would have rushed and bought a bunch of pharmaceutical stock. <laughs> you know, of course, I mean, that's a, that, that, yeah. that would be the intelligent thing to have done. But th th this is to, to me, it's a, uh, I, I understand it and I understand the allure, but I have no interest in it. And nobody will ever convince me when you sing the praises of it, of all the successes that you hear, mm -hmm. wait until we hear the catastrophic failures. Wait until you are a doctor that is talking to somebody who is permanently maimed and has permanent loss of function as a result of these medications. Okay. That life can never be recovered. Okay. And that, that is the, that is the, the roulette wheel that we use whenever we use any of this stuff. Yeah. And you and I both know on the flip side of that coin, what happens when you transition to whole food plant-based Yes, and the incredible uh, results that we have seen again and again and again, year in, year out sure. with literally zero side effects, except for the positive ones that everybody wants. Of course, everything. Right. And, and speaking of that, I'm just going to quickly say, just as a little, a little commercial break here. If anybody's interested in joining us in Sedona in October, we have about 15 spots available. And because Doug is going to be there and to honor Doug, use the code Doug150 and you get 150 bucks uh, off the uh, the trip to Sedona. Sounds hey, good. look what I did. I did a good thing today. That's you great. You sure did. You sure did. <laughs> Doug, this is a question that, that uh, somebody wants to know. So for people who struggle, despite having the knowledge, yes, what in your opinion is the disconnect between knowing better and doing better? Um, so what, I'm sure it all comes back to the pleasure trap, but why mm -hmm. can't people make the change even when they know? Um, the, the reason, yeah, I, I I'm, I'm going to not, I, you know how dangerous <laughs> it is to ask me a question like, <laughs> well, <laughs> the, uh, well, can, we, can we, always, will, we, can, we can also ask you of the dangers of oil. That's one of the questions. See yeah, right there. The, uh, <laughs> it, the, uh, the danger, I mean, the, the problem here is that what your mind is doing is it's it's running a cost benefit analysis. And that's what it runs on everything. So when you when you're in a restaurant and you're looking at a menu, you're running a cost benefit analysis on the four different options that you're looking at. And what your mind does is it it runs simulation programs uh, in imagination as it attempts to try to figure out what the cost benefit is. So if a, uh, uh, if a girl's trying to decide between two dates to the prom that she's been offered, 
that's what she's doing is she's running a cost benefit analysis and she uses her imagination to essentially try to game out in a virtual reality program, which dish you think will be the better all, all around experience. Is it Bill or is it George? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what she's doing. And so that's what your cat is doing when it's, it's uh, looking up and whether or not it's worth taking its paw and scratching your chin to see whether or not, you know, it can get some more treats out of you. It's running a cost benefit analysis. That's what brains do is they run cost benefit analysis. And the, um, the and in humans, you can see evidence of the cost benefit analysis in, in imagination. So people don't just magically eat French fries. They have to imagine the French fries. They're thinking about what those are going to be like. And then they figure out where they're going to go get them. In other words, this is all driven in imagination in a virtual reality program that's yeah. running through the system and generating vestiges of the feelings that you expect to get when you achieve it. So if you see somebody attractive and you're on the dating market and you see them, you, you can't help it. You're thinking about what it would be like in close proximity and touching that person. That's what's going on. You're running virtual reality programs. And so when you're running virtual reality programs on food choices, of course, you've got memories that tell you about what the experience is going to be like to be eating the richer food. And the virtual reality program is going to be like, well, I'd rather eat a meal that's a thousand calories a pound than a meal that's 500 calories a pound. Your virtual reality program can tell you that it's a better decision uh, from the standpoint of your biology, which is the problem that you're having is trying to get energy for as little energy output as possible. So the problem that is at the root of the pleasure trap is that you were simply designed with preferences that saved your life in the stone age so that you made sure to eat peaches instead of romaine lettuce. That's exactly, or to eat nuts instead of the peaches. You're designed by nature to be aiming at the high calorie density when it's available. This is a problem. So what are we going to do about it? And the, the, the solution to the problem is to be consistent enough and have your environment set up well enough mm. that, that you essentially make it so that the virtual reality programs uh, are, are starting to understand that the rich food is out of season, that it's not available, okay? Now, the fact, uh, this, this is true, for example, even with, with an alcoholic with, with wine, that you're designed by nature to know that a food is in season or a resource is in season with respect to food with taste and smell, but not with vision. Mm. Okay, so uh, taste and smell are the 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 primary mechanisms by which you know that a resource is in season. Where if you are an alcoholic and you have not had a drink in five months, you're not particularly tempted because as long as the smell and the taste are not hitting your nervous system, vision is not going to be a big deal. It's not going to. So I can have an alcoholic walk down a wine aisle in a grocery store and not really be pulled very hard at all because the virtual reality program, it, it does not have recent memories of the taste and smell experience. So it really isn't seeing it that it's in season. Mm -hmm. But if they have even a smell of it, now they're in trouble. Okay. And if they have a taste of it, they're going to be sunk. So in the same way, this is going to be true with our dietary problems that if you keep your food sequestered to a healthy, tasty food for a period of time, uh, three or four weeks, that if you do this, effectively, a lot of the virtual reality programs will be quieting down on the concept that the food is even available. Now, if you walk by a pizza place and smell it, then it wakes it up. It says, oh, it's in season. Okay. So you're in a little trouble right now for you know the next few minutes until you get out of there and you quit smelling that because it's going to be pushing you. But as soon as you get out away from it and you haven't actually chomped it down, it's quieting down in the system pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So your job is to essentially organize your behavior well enough around whole, uh, healthy foods that and staying away and keeping it at bay, the teasing of the system so that you don't keep telling the nervous system that it's in season. If you do that, then it's always going to be a heck of a dogfight because the system is designed by nature to keep going for 
the richest resources available. And if it knows they're available, you're not going to forget about it. So I've noticed this, you know, I've been known to eat some Halloween candy. And if I do that, the problem is I'm, I'm in trouble for the next several days because it's like, okay, it's in season. Now, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, once I throw it all away or, you know, manage to get rid of it, then what happens is, is that two or three weeks later, it's Doug, Doug, well I got I to gotta ask you a question though. How are you getting Halloween candy? You're not going trick or treating. <laughs> yes, I have gone trick or treating with uh, little kids, uh, essentially grandchildren. And so, yeah, that this is exactly, and I'm not above stealing their candy. <laughs> so I, I, I am not a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a true North saint. Okay. Yeah. Alan Goldhammer is a true North saint, but I'm not. So I'm a real person. Yeah. And I will, I will indulge myself into the pleasure trap every now and then, not all the way into the trap, but I will tease the system. But I know when I tease it, I'm asking for two or three days of turbulence in my motivation. Like I know it's going to happen. And well, uh, yeah. Well, what's interesting is you, you used uh, three words that I've never heard you use before. And I've heard you give a lot of talks. And that was, you used the term virtual reality programming. Yes. Which I really like that as well. Yes. Um, and, and that's an easy way for, I think, people to connect to what you're referring to. You know, another thing that that you say, and we've kind of refined it with uh, Adam Sud is make your environment look like your goals, right? You know what? I keep forgetting that, but like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. And as soon as I heard that kid say that, I'm like, he's a kid. He's going to, he's going to, wrinkle his eyebrows because isn't he 40 now uh yeah 40 I 41 mean, he, he looks like to that. me like he's about 30 and as far as i'm concerned he's always going to be the kid but that that young man has nailed it that is exactly how how we have to look at that i love that analogy it's beautiful i've never heard of a better one make your environment look like your goals yeah and for people that don't know who we're talking about this is adam sud on instagram he's at plant-based addict he will be joining us in Sedona. He actually came to one of our retreats when he was 330 plus pounds, uh, addicted to Adderall, cocaine in 2010. You actually weren't at that retreat, Doug. Mm -hmm. um, and it truly is amazing to see how far Adam has come and just uh, what a pillar he has become of the, of the whole food plant-based uh, community and sure. what he's doing with his guns and you know getting big and strong. <laughs> He is getting after it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is a uh, when you see things like that. Yeah, you it, it makes you feel like everything is possible. It does. Yes. And that that we can get thrown in our community because our community will attract people like Adam that, that have that kind of commitment and determination. And you see someone that can absolutely transform their entire life history. Uh, and he did. And so it can be done. We know it can be done. We've seen it and it makes us, it makes us feel like, Hey, why can't the whole country do this and turn their life around? And we look at it and we think, well, in principle it could, but actually in reality it can't. And mm -hmm. it's, it's because the, this problem, people that are listening to this are among a, uh, a modest sized minority that have this as a potential for them. Uh, if you have this level of interest, if you're listening to us, this is not an accident. You, you have sought out this information and you're curious and you're interested. This makes you an unusual person. You may not think you're that unusual, but in fact you are. And so what is, uh, is this is possible for you, but it's not going to be possible for Johnny Lunchbucket right smack in the middle of the bell curve in this society. That guy is is headed to to uh, the life that he's going to live and whatever modern medicine can do to mitigate it. And it's not going to be too good, but hopefully he'll he'll have a decent life experience and 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 be OK. But it's not going to be good uh, to be good. you got to treat your body better. Yeah. Uh, two days ago, Doug, our AC upstairs went out. And so I called. Um, you know, one of these HVAC companies, John Gonzalez or John came out yeah. and he told me that his father 
has had two heart attacks. He's like 51 now, um, severely overweight and can't get a job because he can hardly walk. So I gave him a copy of, you know, this, the engine two seven day rescue book. Um, and he came back the next day and was super excited at that, you know, gave it to his father and his father was hopeful, but you know, there's so many people, whether I'm driving in a taxi or an Uber, or, you know, and you have these conversations with people because you want to reach out and you want to help them Sure. because you and I, we know what's at the other end. If people will just be able to grasp the, the basic nut of what we're trying to um, get across. Yes, that's very true. And the thing is, is that you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they're going to have it. <laughs> you yeah. can't. You cannot tell. <laughs> there's there's no way we would have known that that was sitting inside of Adam. Yeah. No yeah. possible. And he didn't know. And no. so this is this is why we just keep spreading our message and do the very best we can and 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 touch as many people as we can. But also understand that this will this will not be something that if you get it, it doesn't mean your sister or your brother or your husband or your wife or your children or your parents are going to get it. In yeah. other words, you have to you have to be willing to, you know, you fix yourself first. And then if it leaks to other people, great. But if it doesn't, you know, then that wasn't meant to be. Here, I got a question on the screen for you, yeah. Doug. Dr. Lyle, I'm 135 days free from using the medical cannabis trap. Dr. Vera Tarman talked about the psychological withdrawals taking up to one to two years. Do you know of any other withdrawal symptom or symptoms? Uh, symptoms other than what? The the um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I guess yeah. there's psychological withdrawals, maybe anything else. Like with alcohol, for example, you know, there's there's withdrawals and yeah, and you're drugs. you're yeah. going to you're you're you know, you're the uh, we know from uh, if a person used something like this long term that there can be uh, it can take quite a while for for the the neurochemistry to all wind up getting regulated back to kind of where it started. And so it can be as much as three years. OK, uh, might even be longer in some cases, but probably not for this uh, longer term recovery has been shown to happen in things like cocaine and, and methamphetamine. So in other words, that you can disrupt the brain function enough that it takes years and years for it to get all the way back to more normal. But that doesn't mean it's not mostly back to normal after a year or two. Okay, same thing with alcohol. So you're mostly normal after a year or so. You're better after three years. And uh, and you still may be only 95% of normal at that point. So wow. I'm not too worried about uh, how long these things take. As long as you're doing pretty well, the, the good news is, is that you could still be improving. And, um, and so that, that's, you know, that's the, that's one of the reasons why I try to stay away from all this stuff. I just can't believe a three, a three year tail on some of these things. Yeah. More they've, they've shown that <laughs> some of it could be 10 years. So you, you, you can see that you effectively, and the, 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 that the brain is still recovering, uh, very, very slowly from the, from essentially the disruption that is caused by a really heavy duty drug. So, yeah. Um, B wants to know, could schizophrenia be resolved with whole food plant-based? Um, no, it cannot be. So schizophrenia is a, uh, is a, a, a cluster. It's a, it's a, a name we use for a cluster of, of, uh, of, Ex, uh, it, mental experiences that are odd, and um, and those those are derivative of um, thousands of subtle little uh, a co combination of genes that result in a, a a nervous system that's a little bit you know can be a little bit or can be very unusual. So the um, the medications are. Uh, generally, I would say very bad news. So the medications are not a solution to schizophrenia. If you're if you've got someone close to you and you have questions about this, I mean, the first place that I would ever go 
to learn about this would be Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. Mm -hmm. uh, the, but in terms of whole foods, plant-based nutrition, um, that's going to be a hard, that's a high bar to try to get somebody's uh, diet to improve that is struggling with, with uh, limitations that are around schizophrenia. Um, so I'm not, uh, and it's not going to fix it, uh, but, but certainly people can feel better physically. They can be calmer if they're less stimulated by a bunch of the, the junk food that people very often eat. A lot of schizophrenics are disturbed by a lot of internal stimuli and they, 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 they'll, they'll, uh, it helps focus their attention a little bit temporarily if they smoke cigarettes. So a high percentage of them will smoke cigarettes and they'll get a, several minutes of relief of their mind not being kind of so open and fragmented. So this is a hard problem, but uh, it's going to turn out that um, that most of the best of what we have for uh, for schizophrenia is peaceful, calm environments without too much stimulation, uh, healthy food, really good regular biorhythms of you know not staying up uh, so late at night and getting up at a reasonable time in the morning and getting some daily exercise and reasonably healthy food. This is and some productive activity during the day that's simple enough uh, that they can that they can do this and in, in a supportive social environment. This is uh, i.e. living in a small town, okay, or living in something that looks and feels like a small town uh, in a nice, simple, supportive environment. This is this is the best treatment that there is for schizophrenia. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Doug. How long have you been uh practicing psychology i've been a psychologist for more than 30 years okay what are your thoughts on screens and screen time and what it's doing to the the mind and are you is this something that you are seeing with people that your patients that you're talking to and having to like try and get to the bottom of that and and try and yeah. minimize it yeah yeah i think that one of the problems is is that the the world's wealthy enough that that literally people aren't having to work 100 hours a week the way they used to so if they had to work 100 hours a week then they couldn't be staring at screens all day so we we what we're looking at is one additional new way for people's lives to get out of balance and so uh uh, the screens are inherently interesting. There's interesting information on there, uh, and they're now designed by nature, uh, now designed cleverly by robots to try to figure out what's going to pull your nervous system and find out what's a little one percent more enticing. So basically, the same thing is happening with your attention as what happened in the foods in the second half of the 20th century. They got increasingly sophisticated about how to put the food together so that you can't keep yourself out of it, and they're doing exactly the same thing with your attention. So. Uh, if we're not careful and you don't set up boundaries, i.e. make your, make your, uh, goals look like your environment is what Adam would tell us. And so, you know, I have never in my life been on Facebook it has never happened. Okay. <laughs> what, about, what about Instagram? Have you been on, never Instagram? Been on Instagram? So no. in other words, the, the, and I'm bragging like I'm some saint, but the truth is, is I'm technologically incompetent. And so, uh, therefore, my life remains remarkably 20th century. <laughs> well, I need to. I need to say that I just wanted to see if you'd posted anything in Instagram before we went on today, no, no. so I could like ask you questions. And of course, I found a Doug Lyle. Yeah, but it's a Doug Lyle that says <laughs> he says I like to pick things up and put them down again. This guy's a power lifter, and and he, and he also loves the Warhammer 40k log. There you go. There you go. Not me. No. I, I very quickly, it was like, oh, that's not that's not the, the Doug that I know and love. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, wow, that's remarkable that you've never been on Facebook or Instagram. Wow. Like I said. So, so not, if you, but here's smart. the thing, though, Doug, Doug, yeah. Doug, I, if you will indulge in a little bit of Halloween candy, you yeah. must indulge a little bit of Netflix or something like oh, that. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. And so it's going to turn out that this is one of these things like um, it's all about balance, you know? So uh, if you got a basketball team, it's all about balance. And uh, with your diet, it's about balance. 
And so it's also true with uh, with everything in your life. And so we we have to look at all of these things like um, uh, we, we have to look at everything. Everything needs to be under a reasonable amount of scrutiny about is this thing pulling my life out of balance? Yeah. So there's people that can go into a casino and, you know, spend two or three hundred dollars a year, a couple times a year, you know, playing a little bit of blackjack for an hour. And that's that. And then there's people whose lives are destroyed by it. There's people that can have a glass of wine now and then on some special occasion. There's people whose lives are destroyed by it. And the same thing is going to be true with all of the screens and media. You, you can have your life uh, probably not destroyed by it, but certainly impoverished. Mm -hmm. And and that is a that is something that is very evident that is happening. And, you know, just like the food, you know, you're going to be you're, you're going to have a lot of, of human life essentially not destroyed, but made mediocre. Mm -hmm. So so we need to respect that, that 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 they're after us. You know, you know, you know, what's destroying my life right now is pickleball. I can't yeah. get enough pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good way to destroy your life, Rick. That's a perfect place. That's good. I hope I hope we get to play again uh in Sedona. I'm sure we will. Good, good, good. Yeah. Hey, Doug, uh, this has been absolutely terrific. I, I appreciate uh you on such short notice jumping in to, to tackle some of these questions on these weight loss drugs and how, you know, um Big question marks there, and yes. uh, and how we believe that whole food plant based is a, a much smarter choice. Absolutely, you bet, real. Yeah. yeah. So I will see you see in you just Sedona. over a month and a half in the Red Rock Mountains of Sedona. And again, anybody, if you want to join us, Adam Sud, Jane, Doctor Clapper, the whole incredible Plant Strong team, and about eighty other people that are want to enjoy everything there is about plant strong living use the code doug 150 thanks doug. thanks doug <laughs> my pleasure thanks for having me Rip. yeah yeah hey give me a give me a virtual fist bump on the way out Boom. there you go perfect bye, bye have folks. a great weekend everybody